gathered here this morning, Jesus, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus. There's just something about that name. He doesn't come to fill this building. He comes to fill, fill our hearts and lives this morning. Oh, Jesus, whether in the room or online this morning, we open up our hearts to you. To let every heart prepare him room. The mere mention of your name, Jesus, brings hope, brings peace, brings life, brings healing. Oh, Jesus, we're gathered around your name this morning. We wouldn't be here except for you. We would have no song to sing except because of you. There's just something about your name. And so I just speak the name of Jesus over everyone gathered here today, those online, into the very deepest parts of our lives and our souls, the very places people don't see. We speak the name of Jesus, the life giver, our only hope, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name of Jesus that has redeemed us has cleansed us, has saved us, given us a future and a hope. It's you, Jesus, that we come to glorify. It's you that we come to lift up. It's you we come to exalt. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Well, that's, that's why we're gathered here today. We're not really gathered under under a church name or a church denomination, we gather under the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. You just take your seats for a second. We're going to watch church news before we go on this morning.
um, let's see what's happening in the life of that shop. So next weekend we're doing a Christmas Wonderland. We, you, make sure to get your tickets now. Remember we need helpers for both nights. So Hudson, are you going to be at church next um, Sunday? Yes, of course. No silly, we have our Christmas Wonderland next weekend. So church, remember to get, don't come to church next weekend. So Hudson, did you know that Christmas Day is coming out? Yeah, I'm so excited. The service starts at 9am bright and early, not 10am, and it goes for one whole hour. So get ready, church, because Christmas Day is coming out soon. That's the end of church news, guys. So get up out of your seats. It's time for praise and worship. Bye. 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 Okay, we'll put them on permanently to replace Ethan and Jared. So we are meeting next weekend, but it's Saturday and Sunday night, not Sunday morning. So if you only come Sunday morning, you need to change your calendar to come Saturday night and bring someone to come Sunday night because it's our church and we want to celebrate with our community. And if you're not here, our community can't see the full extent of Jesus because Jesus is in all of us, not just those up the front. So next Sunday, next weekend is Saturday night. Pastor Beck will say more. And Sunday night, okay? Let's just stand briefly. We're going to greet one another quickly. Our offering buckets are at the end of our aisles. If you brought your offering today, and as we do, our kids are going to go out this morning. So if you brought your offering, we thank you, Lord. You're our provider. The buckets are there uh, on, the, on the end of the line as our kids go out this morning. And Pastor Beck comes. Thank you. Where's Jenny? Team have been working hard um, for that. I mean, how beautiful does the tables all look over there for our seniors lunch today and our brass band are going to be playing all through uh, the lunch. So I, well, pretty much. They're going to get fed through, through they, I promise. Um, and while they're just um, sorting themselves out, I wanted Jenny to tell a story um, that highlights why you inviting someone next weekend can be instrumental to their future. So can you just tell the story, Jenny? Um... A few, I don't know, a few weeks ago, uh, Levi had said to me, can one of his friends from school come to youth with us? And I was like, of course. And he said, can you ring the mum? So I rang the mum and she said to me, oh, actually, Levi said to me, he goes, what's Pastor Jeff's last name? And when I told him, he said, that's him. That's the one. So then I rang the mum and the mum said, you know, Pastor Jeff was my boss for so many years and he was the best boss I've ever had. And he invited me and his, uh, her older children to the Christmas Wonderland. And so she came and she had a great time at the Wonderland. So now fast forward, I don't know how many years, maybe 10, maybe, maybe a little bit more even. Um, and she said, you know what, he can come to youth because I've been to your church. I've been to Christmas Wonderland. I know Pastor Jeff. I trust him. Um, there's no problem, he can show up. And I just thought that was amazing. And uh, something that was so, so many years ago 
has now come to fruition now. And um, I just thought it was beautiful. So you don't know who you're inviting this next weekend that may be okay, they may not come back to church the next week or... But somewhere down the track, we're believing that the seeds that we sow will bear much fruit. And so now this kid, mum has no problem with him coming to youth because, number one, the seed that Jeff sowed as a good boss. But then second, the fact that he invited, took a chance and invited someone from work and say, hey, you should come along. Our church has got this Christmas event on. And in doing so, now we're reaching her son. So I want you to think about who you might invite next weekend. There's Saturday or Sunday night. There's sessions on Saturday night that are already sold out. This is the premise of the story. We're putting on an interactive experience where the pirates have come and stolen the Christmas story. And the kids are going to be taken on an interactive experience to rescue the Christmas story so that we can uh, send it off around the world. So that's kind of the, the premise of the Christmas story. And so if you're an adult, you don't need to register um, but if you have kids coming, they need to register because we have got people dressed up and they're going to take them all around the property. And we're excited that the preschool and the school are joining us to put this on this year. So they're going to go and look for puzzle pieces in the preschool sand pit. And there's a dunking machine that the, the school have got. And the, there's just going to be a whole bunch of fun um, all around the property. I think we've got, you know, kind of races in the gym. There's just going to be a whole lot of fun that's going to be had. And at the same time, um, we're going to have a bit of a jazz band and we're going to do all our own food this year so that we can um, help cover the costs. And so we really need you to, you know, in years past we've had a pizza truck and other people kind of come in and do that. And we realised that even though there's a place for that, when we do that it stops a lot of you feeling like you can get involved. So we've got a whole bunch of things that you can get involved in. So would you um, consider inviting on one night and serving on another. There's no Sunday morning service, but Friday, uh, Saturday night and Sunday night at five o'clock, we'll be here and we're hoping you will. We're going to pray over next weekend and um, praying that even as you think of, I know social media has begun to be filled with um, invitations. You might like to get on our Instagram or our Facebook, forward that on to someone. You just never know. Maybe they'll say, hey, I'd love to come. Uh, there's no charge for the kids' activities. It's all free so they can come and just uh, enjoy themselves. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've called us to make a difference and that there are people that um, would love to do things this Christmas and get to know people and find a community of love and joy and acceptance. And I thank you that that's what we are. So help us, Lord God, to be good inviters this Christmas. I pray, Lord God, that even as they... Um, even as our church think about people in their world that they could invite, bring people across their path this week that they could just invite to come along. I pray, Lord God, that we would serve you and serve you well. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Shout. 
Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't it feel like Christmas when the brass... Hello. I think we need a name for them. Someone come up with a good name. Well, while you're um, sitting there, would you turn to Isaiah chapter 9? I have the privilege this morning of continuing our series. And Pastor Oren beautifully started last week on Isaiah 9. One of the most common scriptures that we hear at Christmas. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And I thought it was interesting just thinking about how Pastor Oren was bringing that last week, that... For God so loved the world that he came, but he didn't just come just widespread, although he came widespread. But he made it personal. He came for you and for me. And I was remembering, I shared with the seniors on Thursday, I was remembering at the Last Supper where Jesus sat there with his disciples and he broke the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken. What did he say? For you. And Isaiah would use the same term for unto us. It's for you that he came. And Jesus at that last supper would say, this is my body which was broken for you. He came for a reason. You know, Timothy Keller um, does the most beautiful illustration of Christmas and the Christmas story. And I loved it so much. He says, really when you think of it, You can sum up Christmas as this, God had to come downstairs himself. And he says, can you picture a, you know, a house, a two-story house, the first floor and the second floor, or the first floor on the ground floor, I can picture it, my house is like that, and you're upstairs and your kids are downstairs causing havoc. There's, you can hear the noise, you can hear the rumbling, you can hear them fighting, and so all of a sudden you start Sending down your word down the stairs. Hey, stop mucking around. Don't do that. Come on, get dressed. Get ready. Come on, hurry. And you start sending your word down the stairs. You send, you know, maybe even some you know, advice. And, and eventually the noise doesn't stop. They still don't get the picture. They're ready to kill themselves and everyone else in the house. You can hear the calamity. And then you realize you have to go down the the stairs yourself. And the word then becomes flesh, doesn't it? (laughs) And the word is now incarnate in person, and you are now on the ground floor looking at your kids, doing whatever they're doing, and you now have come to save them from themselves. And his illustration is that that is Christmas in a nutshell, that Jesus came down the stairs. He no longer sent his word, but he became the word, John would say, uh, in the flesh incarnate that he would save us from ourselves. He wasn't just sent, he was given. He was sent, but not just sent, hear me. He was given. For unto us a child is born, For unto us a son is given. Um, I was telling the seniors on Thursday, my uh, youngest child um, spent the weekend, we were away last weekend, and she spent the last, last weekend with my dad. And my dad often will tell me about how excited I used to be for Christmas and wake them up at all hours of the morning. Anyway, and so there's another little girl who's, following in my footsteps, and she says to him, Grandpa, I need to know what I'm getting for Christmas. And he says, well, I'm not telling you what you're getting for Christmas. She says, I don't like surprises. You have to tell me what I'm getting for Christmas. And then the clincher, if you really loved me, Grandpa. 
you'll tell me what I'm getting for Christmas. He didn't, he didn't renege. He didn't renege. Um, the boys were for sure that he'd cave in uh, to that, but he didn't. And I thought it's interesting that we love gifts, most of us. Um, love getting a good gift, but there is a point where the surprise kind of, we're ready for that. But have you ever received a gift that was beyond what you ever thought? Like you got a gift that was beyond comprehension, imagination. You could never have imagined getting a gift this beautiful or this good. Or, um, and Jesus, this gift was a surprise. It shouldn't have been a surprise, but it was. They weren't expecting a gift like this in a package like this. And when you think of yours and my life, when we think of a savior, when we think of a hero, we don't think of a baby. I don't know about you, but if you've had a baby in your house recently, savior and hero probably aren't the words that you'd use for the baby. A lot of hard work may be the words you'd use for the baby, but savior and hero, and yet our savior came as a babe. Jesus was not the kind of gift they were expecting. He was a different kind of gift. So in that context, when we look at this word or these two words we're going to use today, you know, um, over the years, and I think Handel kind of helped this idea when he wrote the Messiah was he separated wonderful and counselor. If you know the... um, the Messiah, Handel's Messiah, and he made, I guess, this even portion of Scripture famous for Christmas time. And he would say, wonderful, and then comma, counselor. But actually, in the original text, there's no comma there. It's just wonderful counselor. Would you say that with me? Jesus is your wonderful counselor. Jesus is your wonderful counselor. The context of this uh, scripture being given, uh, you can have a look on your screens. In Isaiah 7, 14, Isaiah would prophesy and he'd say this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. And behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. You'll call his name God with us. You'll call his name, he's with you. This gift that you get, I'm not going to just, you know, give the instructions from upstairs. This gift now will be given to you. And his name will be called Emmanuel. The first thing I want you to realize is that this prophecy was not made at Christmas time. It was spoken into a real and troublesome situation. It was 730 B.C., And King Ahaz was nervous because Assyria was forming an army to attack Jerusalem. And he was wondering the best way to defend himself, who he should form an alliance with and so forth. And so God sends the prophet Isaiah to him and says, don't worry about your alliances, I will protect you. Okay, so this prophecy is given into a battle scenario. This prophecy is not given into, oh, it's very lovely. This prophecy is given into a battle scenario. And then, which should be reassuring, but evidently Isaiah could tell from my Ahaz's expression that he was still worried. He says to Ahaz, don't worry, Ahaz. God will give you a miraculous sign to prove he'll protect you if you trust him. Now, you'd think Ahab would be like, good, a sign from God that God's going to protect me in the battle would be... Um, appealing to Ahaz, but instead he says, no, 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 don't do that, because evidently he thinks if God gives me a sign, then I'm going to have to obey him. So I prefer that God didn't give me a sign so I can do whatever I want. So Isaiah says, okay, well, you don't want a sign. Well, because then you'll be obligated to obey. Well, God will give you one anyway, and here's your sign. And into that context, Isaiah 7 is written, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. In the middle of a trouble situation, in the middle of battle, in the middle of upheaval, here's your sign that the Lord himself will give you a sign that a virgin will conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. 
So basically the king is being told that there's a new king being born. Remind you of anything else in the Christmas story when a new king was being born and the former king was starting to get up worried? It reminded me of the wise men who were coming in and they're like, oh, we're looking for the new king. What did Herod do? He starts freaking out and he starts putting into, I'm going to kill every you know, child under two. Let's annihilate power, losing power. In, even in that context, I mean, probably still in today's context, causes people to do the most horrific of things and exactly this context. I want, to, I want you to note one thing about biblical prophecy. It's that a lot of biblical prophecy is this way. There is an immediate fulfillment in the scriptures in the prophet's day, and then there is an ultimate fulfillment in the future. So um, if you go ahead and you sing the song, Joy to the World, which we sing at Christmas, actually that is a, that is a carol about the second coming of Jesus. If you sing that this Christmas, when you get there, and if you limit your thinking to the first time that Jesus came, that's fine. It totally fits. But if you hear it, joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. When Isaac Watts wrote joy to the world, he was thinking of the time when Jesus will come again and take us home. And so often prophecy will have an immediate fulfillment and then a future fulfillment. I've heard it described like this. If you looked out over a mountain range, sometimes you see the mountain peaks that look like they're connected and one range seems to go right into the other. But if you were to actually go to them, you'd see there is actually quite a bit of distance, sometimes several kilometers between them, and that's how biblical prophecy works. It looks like one promise, but there's actually a gap of time between the first fulfillment and the ultimate fulfillment. If I've lost you, that's okay, come back. There was a partial fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy when King Hezekiah was born. You can go ahead. I think it's important that we give you the context of this so you don't just think, oh, it's just it's looking forward, because... This, these are the Hebrew scriptures, and the Jewish people, when they read this passage of Isaiah, they believe that this has already been fulfilled in King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah, you'll look in Isaiah, I think it's 36 to 39, and they will unravel uh, his story. And King Hezekiah was a, a good king compared to his is it father or grandfather Ahaz. And there was a partial fulfillment in King Hezekiah, but they realized that, it didn't, he, that when Hezekiah came, he did. There were certain things and certain parts of this prophecy that him coming into this role fulfilled, but there were gaps because he was human. Now you may ask, how would a prophecy about the birth of, of a Messiah that wouldn't come for 700 years ultimately answer the problem that I has had? into a very real, dire felt need situation, an impending attack. God gives a promise about a Messiah who won't be born for 700 years. And I think um, sometimes when we talk to you know, friends, neighbors, family about Jesus, they feel the same way. How can a baby that was born 2,000 years ago how can that have any relevance to the issues and the problems that I face today? Don't you think? When you talk, if you've had a conversation, there's often those questions that they pose. But the birth of, the Jesus, birth of Jesus addressed their problem. It addressed the problem at the root in saying that there's hope on the horizon and it won't always be that way. And sometimes, even just pointing out that our problems are much deeper than merely an enemy army arrayed against us, or health issues, or relational conflict, or economic need, but the root of all our problems is, separated, is separation from God and our sin that separates us from Him. So God had to give hope a name and wrap it up in a gift that we would receive. And so into that context, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. 
I love what Walter Brueggemann says. He says, it turns out that recognition of this new king is not just a Christmas Eve lark. It constitutes a new vocation. It's not only an acknowledgement of his new rule in the world, but a recruitment for action congruent with the new regime. The increase of his government will not be by supernatural imposition or by royal fiat. Instead, it will come about through the daily intentional engagement of his people who are so astonished by his wonder that they no longer subscribe to the old order of power and truth that turns out to be in the long run only deliberating fraudulence. It requires an uncommon wisdom to interrupt the foolish practice of business as usual. And so, I want to talk to you for the remaining time this morning about this wonderful Counselor. It's the first of four royal titles. When they were going to decree a new king, they would say, This king is coming to us, and they would give him titles. And so Isaiah gives these four royal titles of Jesus, and he says, Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace. This wonderful counselor. You know what, you can actually um, translate this, he's a wonder of a counselor. He is a wonder of a counselor. And you may have been to a counselor and sat with a counselor and began to talk through some issues or process some things out, and I've never used the word, oh, they're wonderful. I mean, you may have, I just haven't. I've said they're good, they're very good. They're excellent. But wonderful donate denates for me this wonder. This ability to step back and look and take another view of really the beauty and the goodness of our God. The counselor in this term means to exercise governance. So if you're on a board here, maybe a school board, or you're in the local PNC, or preschool committee or the church council, it's a board. It means that he is a wise governor. We talk about in in a board setting, wise governance and doing things right and true and integrous. And this word is exactly that, that you have, you and I have. He's been given to us that we have a wonderful counselor, one who is able to govern our lives with wisdom. Jonathan Edwards determined that the one big difference between religious people and those who have a revelation of grace is praise. And I'm mentioning that because wonder can be thought of as involuntary praise. It's praise that just erupts, almost spontaneous praise. And you think about it, you start walking in creation and then you see a beautiful you know, scene or mountain or we were by the beach last weekend, you can look at the water and almost involuntary, almost like not thinking about it, you come out, oh, that's beautiful. That is praise. And Jonathan Edwards says that the difference between those of us who have had a moment looking at our Savior and those that just do their religious duty is that you can uh, look at the temperature of their heart and praise is a part of that. C.S. Lewis said uh, that he realized that praise almost seemed to be the very thing that you could test how healthy we were on the inside in our Christian walk. He said that inner health was made audible. He says that praise expresses and completes the joy. He said this, he says, I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. In it, it is its appointed consummation. Here's what this is saying. C.S. Lewis had this revelation. And you go ahead and read. He found praise and worship really difficult to understand as an intellectual. And then he wrote, uh, you might like to go and find it. It's called Reflections on the Psalms, A Word About Praising from C.S. Lewis. It's fantastic. And he talks about the way that we praise, the way that we look in wonder at our Savior and the way that we understand the grace that we've been given, the way that we express that can be used to test the temperature of our spiritual heart. The word for wonderful means beyond understanding that he is the one who advises or instructs or guides from a position of authority. 
This is not someone uh, that you call late at night and download all your problems to and then wonder, hmm, do they really know what they're talking about? I'm not too sure about their advice. This is not that kind of counselor. This wonderful counselor is someone to whom you bring your worst problems and he shows you the way out. You know, a man fell into a pit and he couldn't get himself out. So a Christian scientist came along and said, you only think you're in a pit. And then a Pharisee said, well, only bad people fall into a pit. A fundamentalist said, you deserve the pit. A politician said, be angry that you're in a pit. A social worker came by and said, we brought you some food and clothing while you're in the pit and gave them some. An optimist said, things will get better. And a pessimist said, things will get worse. But Jesus came along and grabbed his hand and pulled him out of the pit. This wonderful counselor not only has the ability to guide you with his word, but he has the ability and the power to pull you out, grab you by the hand and lead you forward. You know, many of the counselors that we sit with today, uh, they make us do the work ourselves, which, which is fine. But I kind of come away going, I'm paying all this money. This is the kind of counselor that when you go, He gives you sound, beautiful advice, wisdom that that literally leaves you in awe. Have you ever had that God idea, that God drop, that you've been doing something a certain way and all of a sudden you think of a totally different way and you can tell that idea did not come from my head. I don't know how all of a sudden that's come, but all of a sudden it's like, oh, and you know. The wonderful counselor is guiding you and leading you forward. So this wonderful counselor should exhibit from us praise expressed. So just a really simple question, even as we come to conclusion, is what makes a counselor wonderful? If you were to describe a counselor that you had as wonderful... What makes them wonderful? If his very name and his name shall be. Listen, it's not just that he he brings wonderful counsel. It's not just that. His name is wonderful counselor. In the Hebrew scriptures, when someone was given a name, it wasn't just a name, it dictated their entire life. If you look at um, Caleb in the Bible, the word means determined, almost like a dog, like just I will go after it and I will go after it. You think about Caleb in the Bible and, and eventually what he was able to achieve that at 80 years of age, he would go into the promised land and still hold on, give me my land. This is a man with determination to go after what has been set before him. That oftentimes the names they were given denoted what they would bring to the table. It denoted who they were as people. And God says through the prophet Isaiah, here's what my name is. My name I am given to you. And I am your wonderful counselor. I just wrote a couple of things that I thought makes a counselor wonderful. I think a wonderful counselor is wise. Luke 2, 40 and 52, it says, the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. I think when I go and I see a counselor, I wanna know that they have wisdom. I think a good, a wonderful counselor speaks with authority. They know what they're talking about. The last thing you want to do is go and meet with a counselor and really they're just telling you what you want to hear. You want to go and speak to someone who knows the way forward and can see the way forward and who speaks with an authority. And Jesus, um, in Mark 1.22, it says, his teaching was wonderful because he exhibited an authority of the scribes, the shrewdest and most learned of his contemporaries. They marveled at the authority that he spoke with. And we've just finished a series on Psalm 139 where Jesus knows everything about everything. So I think he has more than enough authority to speak into 
our lives. John 11 says this, in the beginning, the word already, ex- uh, John 1, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God and God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. I think he's more than qualified, don't you think? To bring um, some counsel to us. I think the third thing is, when you go and see a counselor, you want to know that they have an understanding of what you're talking about. You want to know that they have an empathy to relate to what you're talking about. They have an understanding that they're not vague, that they have the ability to answer your questions. And Luke 2 Talking about the young Jesus, Luke 2, 47 to 48, says that all who heard him were amazed at his understanding, wait, and his answers. And I'm reading that, I'm thinking some of you have some questions you're asking God right now. He has the ability to know how to answer it. He has the ability to know your way forward. Some of his answers, I just want to warn you that as you go through the scriptures, oftentimes he'll answer you with another question. So just be prepared. I think a counselor provides a safe place for processing and receiving instruction. Psalm 32, 7 and 8, the psalmist would say, you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. The Lord says in verse eight, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. I think the best counselors are always available and close to you. Many of you go to counselors that you try and reach them and it's outside their business hours, so forget it. This wonderful counselor, 24 seven available. I mean. Some of us are in, you know, different jobs or different things where we're available certain times and maybe we'll have a period of time where we turn off our phone or we become unavailable just to have a breather. This, this God, he doesn't sleep or slumber, my Bible says, that he is always available and he's close. This counselor relates to how you feel. I don't want to go to a counselor that when I'm beginning to talk to them, They have no compassion. They have no idea what I'm going through and they just give me the... You know, and the writer of Hebrews explains why it is that Jesus can be a help to us. He says, verse 15, he says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. He's not just a king who rules over us. He is a wonderful counselor who walks beside us. He understands our problems. What I love about the name wonderful counselor, it means that Jesus came for people with problems. Aren't you relieved? He didn't just come for people who had it all together. He didn't come for people that, you know, put on a mask and polished it up. He came for people who were real and who had problems. You know what? I was thinking about it this week. Every miracle that Jesus ever did started with a problem. Every single one. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He came for people with problems. He said he came not for the healthy, but for the sick. He came not to reward the righteous, but to save the sinner. Some of you have problems this weekend. Let me give you some ground rules for how you come to him. If you're going to get his help, and he's an ever-present help in time of need, then he is, this is all he requires, that you be completely honest with him. Take off the mask. The glasses are not a mask, but I better put it back on. Take off your mask and just be honest. I love it that the very name of the Holy Spirit, that Jesus, the name that Jesus would give the Holy Spirit is paraclete, which means one who comes alongside, our counselor, our advocate. So what if you saw tomorrow as you go to work different? What if you saw that as you go to work tomorrow, right beside you, 
don't do that. that that's a bad idea. No, 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 don't look that way. Or they're going to they're gonna think that you're, oh. What if you paid attention so much to the counselor in your ear? What if you paid attention to the one who is leading you and guiding you? What if you had an awareness that the God of heaven and earth has sent his spirit to walk with you? I mean, everything would change. Like just that realization that as you sit in your desk making decisions, you don't make them alone would change everything. It would increase our pauses to stop and ask him rather than just rushing ahead. It would mean that instead of walking in the house, I walked into my house this week after being away and I had said to the kids, we'll decorate for Christmas. And I had, we had the real tree in the back and, I, and Caleb had wanted to, get, wanted to get to his small group and so I said to him, I don't think you can go. He's like, I cannot miss that group. So he goes, we can do this. I said, okay, we can. So I said, we have two and a half hours. It was our wedding anniversary. I want to do a nice dinner. I said, I'm planning a nice dinner and I'm planning to decorate the tree. Your group is not my top priority. It was his top priority. He goes, mom, if we just delegate the tasks properly, this can be done, okay? Every parent's dream. So I arrive home from being away and literally Caleb had had Silas underneath the, you know, I store my, our Christmas decorations underneath the stairs, got him under and they had literally like gone through to pull all my decorations out. Caleb's like, I know what it looks like. I'm walking in, he goes, don't freak out. I know what it looks like. I'm going to fix it. You don't need to worry. It'll be fine. And sometimes our lives, we look at the state that they are going, ah. God doesn't walk into your life and freak out at the state of things. He walks in and sees the potential. He has nowhere else that he has planned to go but to be with you. And so as you approach this wonderful counselor, would you just be honest? Just come to him and be honest. I think the second thing that you need to remember as you approach this wonderful counselor is that you have to want his help. You know, in the scriptures, he went to a man who had a shriveled hand and he says, stretch out your hand. And there is a decision that oftentimes we make, we hide our deficiencies, we hide our weaknesses, we pretend like we're good. But if he wanted his hand healed, what did he have to do? He had to show that it was shriveled and he had to bring it to the Savior. And then the third thing was the musicians come, I think you, when the wonderful counselor comes, you need to be ready to do whatever he says. Timothy Keller says this, he says, what is most wonderful and not the way that he fixes our problems, but his presence with us in these problems. That wonderful presence is more valuable than any solution he could ever bring. His guiding presence with us, too wonderful for words. And you and I know sometimes he doesn't take away our problems, but his presence completely changes how we go through them. It's like when your kids are facing an exam or they're facing a test or a trial, and as a parent, you just want to come and, don't you? Like a good parent, you want to come and just rescue them and stop them having to do the hard stuff. But you know for their growth and their development, and even for where their future is going to take them, this is going to be good for them. They need to do the test. They need to do. And so what do you as a good parent do? You walk with them. You do everything you know how to do to let them know you're not alone. We're together in this. You'll make it through. You'll get to the other side. And your wonderful counselor... He wants you to know this Christmas that he came for you. Some of you lack wisdom because you haven't asked. Some of you 
have asked so many times, you've given up asking. I want you to take a different look. What if you could see that your wonderful counselor was right here? Hey, Lester, could you come just two seconds? I know you love playing Jesus anyway. And just wherever I go, just follow me, okay? His goodness and his mercy will follow me all the days of my life. So I have a wonderful counselor all day long with me. All I need to do is turn and ask. Have a conversation. Wonderful counselor. Oh, I made this big mistake. How do I get out of this one? It's going to be tricky. I want to hear Jesus like that. I want to walk in step with his spirit. That my steps are not governed by my fear, by my anxiety, or by my worry, or about who's going to be at Christmas, who's not going to be at Christmas, or is my real tree going to stay alive because I got it three days too early. Like, I don't want my Christmas to be governed by that. Oh, I want the counselor who's right beside me just to hear his gentle whisper. This is the way. Walk in it. Would you stand? Thanks, Lester. Can you go to G, Dave, and we'll sing front to us. You know, as you leave today, um, we've been, we produce cards um, for the month, and this is a different verse, but it relates to Wonderful Counselor, the verses from Colossians 2. And the writer says, I want their hearts to be encouraged and joined together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. In him are the hidden of all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And so you can take this card this week and think about this message as Jesus, our wonderful counselor, and reflect. Use that card. Use it as a Bible. But we're going to give you the one... um, that we would have done next week, which Pastor Warren will touch on on the 18th when we come back, which is Mighty God. You're getting two this week so that uh, because there's no service next Sunday, we have the Christmas event on the Saturday and Sunday night, but that you will be able to do that in your devotional this week. I guess the, the question is simple this morning. Do you need a wonderful counsellor? Some of you businessmen are standing or businesswomen are standing there this morning and you are making decisions that are poor. And you need a wonderful counsellor and he is right there available to you. Some of you, great opportunity ahead. And you're looking at crossroads and not knowing which way to go. And you have a wonderful counsellor who knows exactly the path that you're to take. All you need to do is come to Him honestly. Come to Him with humility of heart and ask for help in your time of need. And this scripture says that He is faithful to give it to you when you need it. Some of you have financial situations, even how you spend your money at Christmas. There's a whole bunch of things that really is eating you up on the inside. So if you have health concerns and you're, which way I should go and how to, how to proceed. And literally like this wonderful counselor is just reminding us this morning, you are not alone. Can you hear that this morning? You are not alone. Your wonderful counselor has all the wisdom that you need, so much so that it will make you, oh, involuntary, almost like spontaneous praise erupt from your being and soul because His counsel is that wonderful. 
I think we'll sing this over you this morning. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads and would you bring your own hearts before the Lord? Maybe it's with your kids. Where is it that you need his wisdom and his counsel today? For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And the God. God, we thank you that at the beginning of this Christmas season, you're reminding us of who you are. Oh, and we need that wonderful. We need a wonderful counselor. Help us to be a people that walk in wisdom and awe. <laughs> wisdom of wisdom because the creator of the universe is whispering in our ear. And in awe of who you are that wonder would fill our hearts and souls and erupt in praise. Oh, that we would exclaim, what a wonder, what a wonder of a counsellor you are. And God, if we haven't had that revelation of how great your counsel is to us, I pray that we would experience that counsel even as we take time to stop and reflect, even during this week. Oh, help us to recount and remember and to recount your word to us. Thank you for who you are to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you, church. Don't forget our seniors. We're going to be starting, probably you need to be seated, I guess, about quarter to 12. There's no food today in cafe, just coffee. Uh, So if you'd like a coffee, tea, head to the cafe. Bless you, church.